sex <laughs> is good. <laughs> At least according to some parts of the Bible. In Proverbs 30, there are three things that are too amazing for me, four that I do not understand. The way of an eagle in the sky, the way of a snake on a rock, the way of a ship on the high seas, and the way of a man with a maiden. Ecclesiastes 9. Enjoy life with your wife, whom you love. Now, the Song of Solomon actually gives you instructions how. <laughs> yes, it is. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is more delightful than the wine. Pleasing is the fragrance of your perfumes. Your name is like perfume poured out. No wonder the maidens love you. Take me away with you. Let us hurry. Let the king bring me into his chambers. My lover is to me a sachet of myrrh resting between my breasts. My lover is to me a cluster of henna blossoms from the vineyards of En Gedi. How beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful. Your eyes are like doves. How handsome you are, my lover, and how charming. Our bed is verdant. His left arm is under my head, and his right arm embraces me. My lover spoke and said to me, Arise, my darling, my beautiful one, and come with me. See, the winter is past, and the rains are over and gone. Flowers appear on the earth, and the season of singing has come. The cooing of doves is heard in the land. The fig tree forms its early fruit. The blossoming vines spread their fragrance. Arise, my darling, my beautiful one, and come with me. When I found the one my heart loves, I held him and would not let him go. Till I had brought him to my mother's house, to the room of one who conceived me. And furthermore, I slept, but my heart was awake. Listen, my lover is knocking. Open to me, my sister, my darling, my dove, my flawless one. My head is drenched with dew, my hair with the dampness of the night. I have taken off my robe. Should I put it on again? I have washed my feet, must I soil them again? My lover thrust his hand through the latch opening. My heart began to pound for him. I arose to open for my lover, and my hands dripped with myrrh, my fingers with flowing myrrh on the handles of the lock. I think the lady was in love. <laughs> Listen to the response of her beloved. Oh, how beautiful your sandaled feet, O oh, prince's daughter. Your graceful legs are like jewels, the work of a craftsman's hand. Your navel is a rounded goblet that never lacks blended wine. Your waist is a mound of wheat encircled by lilies. Your breasts are like two fawns, the twins of a gazelle. Your neck is like an ivory tower, your eyes the pools of Heshbon. How beautiful you are, and how pleasing, O oh, love with your delights. Your stature is like that of the palm, and your breasts are like the clusters of fruit. I said, I will climb that palm and grab hold <laughs> of the fruit. <laughs> May your breasts be like clusters of the vine, the fragrance of your breath like apples, and your mouth like the best wine. If you think that passage is racy, <laughs> consider these from 1 Samuel. Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. 
Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David, along with his tunic, even his sword, his bow, and his belt. And Jonathan had David reaffirm his oath out of love for him, because he loved him as he loved himself. And then later in the story, David came out of hiding. David arose out of the place towards the south and fell on his face to the ground and bowed himself three times. And they kissed one another and wept with one another until David exceeded. And Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, for as much we have sworn both of us in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord be between me and thee, and between my seed and your seed forever. And he arose and departed, and Jonathan went to the city. This may be describing an orgasm, and it's between two men. Now, the so-called family values crowd would object to this interpretation. For David was married to Jonathan's sister, Michael. In fact, David also had a second wife, Bathsheba, and he had her husband killed so he could marry her. But David's rampant sexuality was no match for his son, Solomon, who had 700 wives, and because that wasn't enough, 300 concubines. <laughs> It is hard to find a family in the Bible that resembles the family values model of one wife, husband, and children. Abraham, the patriarch of Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, married Sarah, but then pretended that he was, she was his sister so that the Pharaoh would take her into his chambers and give Abraham gifts. They then had a son by Hagar, uh, Sarah's slave, and eventually he and Sarah had a child, so he sent Hagar and her son away. Now, his nephew Lot had a traditional family, a wife and two daughters. Unfortunately, they lived in Sodom. <laughs> when the angry mob wanted to have sex with two male visitors, Lot, being the loving father, offered his two virgin daughters as a substitute. Lot and his family left Sodom. His wife died because she looked back. So his daughters took him in a cave, got him drunk, and had sex with him so they could have kids. Jesus, by tradition, is said to have never married, though there are rumors about his relationship with Mary Magdalene and a mysterious naked young man who ran away from the scene of his arrest, and the Gospel of John repeatedly referring to a particular disciple as the disciple Jesus loved. But Jesus' sexuality remains mostly a mystery. Paul never married. He did concede that sex within marriage is a duty. <laughs> but he felt that the single life was the best for believers. He writes, I wish that all men were as I am, but each man has his own gift from God. One has this gift, then another has that. Now to the unmarried and to the widows, I say, it's good for them to stay unmarried as I am. But if they cannot control themselves, <laughs> they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Paul notes that the other apostles have wives, such as Cephas, known as Peter. Ironically, Peter is traditionally listed as the first pope of the Catholic Church, which does not allow its priests to get married. The Old Testament seems to affirm multiple marriages, while the New Testament suspects marriage. However, if a marriage does occur, the New Testament repeatedly says that women should be submissive. Going back to Leviticus, there are some rules that I think both liberals and conservatives generally agree with, forbidding sex with your mother, your father's wives, stepsisters, granddaughters, aunts, daughters, daughters-in-law. 
but there is disagreement about the laws that prevent homosexuality. Leviticus forbids men having sex with other men, but since the sexual code seems to apply only to men, it does not forbid women from having sex with other women. However, the New Testament closes that loophole. <laughs> with Romans 125, because of this, God gave them over to their shameful lust. Even their women exchanged natural relations with unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned their natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Of course, the gays and lesbians I know have told me that they have been entering into relationships that were nat natural to them. When they tried to be straight, now that was unnatural. <laughs> But putting aside any debate about what is natural or unnatural, we can be quite certain that the Bible stands against lust. Proverbs 6, keeping you from the immoral woman, from the smooth tongue of the wayward life. Do not lust in your heart after her beauty, or let her captivate you with her eyes. For the prostitute reduces you to a loaf of bread, and the adulteress preys upon your very life. Can a man scoop fire into his, laps with, with, into his lap without his clothes being burned? And then lust is often used as a metaphor in the Old Testament for worshiping other gods. In Ezekiel 23, unfaithful Jerusalem is compared to a prostitute. Yet she became more and more promiscuous as she recalled her days of her youth when she was a prostitute in Egypt. And she lusted after her lovers, whose genitals were like those of donkeys and whose emissions were like those of horses. So you long for the lewdness of your youth when in Egypt your bosom was caressed and your young breasts fondled. Sounds like God is a jealous God indeed. <laughs> Jesus speaks about lust being equal to acting on one's lust. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Just when it seems that sex drive is considered inherently bad, we can look back to the Song of Solomon. <laughs> Come away, my lover, and be like a gazelle or like a young stag on the spice-laden mountains. Of course, all this frolicking on the spice-laden mountains may have its consequences. What happens if a woman gets pregnant? Is abortion permissible? Well, the Bible gives at least three affirmations of abortion. Jeremiah has the long-suffering prophet cursing the man who did not kill him in the womb. In Numbers 5, if a man suspects his wife of being unfaithful, he brings her to the priest who gives her a solution to drink. I read from that passage. If she has defiled herself and been unfaithful to her husband, then she is made to drink the water that brings the curse. It will go into her and cause bitter suffering. Her abdomen will swell and her thigh wash waste away, and she will become accursed among her people. If, however, the woman has not defiled herself and is free from impurity, she will be cleared of guilt and be able to have children. This is clearly a termination of pregnancy when the husband thinks that the child is not his. What else would result in the woman becoming infertile? And then consider Amos 1.13. The people of Samaria must bear their guilt because they have rebelled against God. They will fall by the sword and their little ones be dashed to the ground and their pregnant women ripped open. 
Here, abortion and infanticide are commanded by God. God may be pro-abortion, but he isn't pro-choice. The women in all these circumstances have no say in the state of the fetus or their own body. Their body is the property of the man who claimed it. In Exodus 21, if men who are fighting hit a pregnant woman and she gives birth prematurely, but there is no serious injury, the offender must be fined whatever her husband demands and the court allows. Notice the fine gets paid to the husband and not to the woman. The Revised Standard Version of the passage reads, when men strive together and hurt a woman with child so that there is a miscarriage, yet no harm follows. The one who hurt her shall be fined according as the woman's husband shall lay upon them, and she shall pay as the judges determine. If any harm follows, then you should give life for life. If this translation is to be trusted, then clearly the fetus is not equal to a life. Because life for life is given, but if the fetus is destroyed, it's only a fine, the same as if a goat or livestock is destroyed. The Bible is contradictory, and it's a hard place to find a clear rule for sexual laws of today. There are strong statements in support of marriage between one man and one woman. Jesus says, have you read that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female? For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. Jesus prohibits divorce, and churches are bending the rules about that in recent years. Jesus said nothing about abortion or homosexuality, yet that is the current focus of rage by dominant Christians. What principle can we lift from Scripture that gives us a sexual ethic. We can go back to that scripture that Jesus quoted in Leviticus 19, a chapter after the prohibitions against homosexuality, that love your neighbor as yourself. This is the law of mutual respect. Mutual respect requires consent, which requires mutual understanding. Consent is the consistent sexual ethic of essential Christianity. Children are off limits because they cannot give consent. Animals are off limits because they cannot give consent. If you have promised to be only with one person, you need their consent before moving on to another. In loving your neighbor as yourself, women must be given the same respect as men. The dominant Christian ethic is based on the idea that sexual desire is bad because it takes one's focus off of God. Thus, all sex is bad except marital sex, but only if the marital sex is for the purpose of bearing children. Don't have any fun. <laughs> Essential Christianity asserts that we were created male and female. Sexuality is part of who we are. Rather than pretend that it does not exist, Sex can be celebrated in the context of mutuality, honoring what others feel and making choices consistent with the ethic of love. Sexual energy is derived from the energy that created us. 
Sex is the pathway to creation, recreation, and recreation. It is an energy like fire. And like fire, there are dangers to be sure. Disease, unwanted pregnancy, emotional upset. But on the balance, sex is good. <laughs> Please rise as you are able and join in singing hymn 205. <laughs> 